Father, may you break the bread of life, which is your word this morning, as we hear your word, and may you inspire me to communicate from your throne of grace to your people that we may feed from you and hunger no more. In Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you please to sit. <clears throat> Good morning. Today, our topic is the Eucharist. We want to reflect and teach ourselves on the topic of the Eucharist. Eucharist is one of the feasts and the sacraments that our Lord Jesus Christ instituted and commanded us to celebrate in memory of him. So the other one is baptism and the other one is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is a Greek word meaning thanksgiving. And so it is a sacrament where we give thanks to God for what Jesus Christ did to us by offering his body to be broken and killed for our sake. The Eucharist is also referred to as communion or the Lord's Supper. And it is important for us as Anglicans and as people of faith to hold this sacrament with the highest esteem possible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 34, Paul talks about what the Holy Communion is, and he is quoting the words of Jesus in a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus, in verse 26, institutes uh, the Lord's Supper. I will reflect with us on three things. Uh, number one, we will look at the significance of the Eucharist. Then secondly, we will ask, how do we need to come for communion and to take communion? And finally, number three, we will, I will seek to correct some misgivings about the Eucharist. So number one, what is the significance of Eucharist? we do three things at the Eucharist. Number one, we look back to Jesus. In our epistle reading of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, Paul writing and quoting Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. In verse 24 and verse 25, he says, do this in remembrance of me. What are we looking back at, what are we remembering? We are remembering the body of our Lord Jesus Christ that was mutilated, that was killed, that was taken life out of so that we may get life. And so the broken bread at the Lord's table remind us of Jesus' body that was given for us. And the wine that we take is symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. It is good for me at this point to remind us that as Anglicans and largely as Protestants, we view the elements, and that is the bread for the body and wine for the blood as symbolic, whereas the Roman Catholics believe that once they are consecrated at the table, they become the real body and the real blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are some of the key differences between us and the Roman Catholics. But as we remember, we are not simply remembering historical facts. We are not simply rallying around a grave and a monument to remember somebody who died. No, we partake of spiritual realities that are a foundation of our faith. So at the Lord's table, we have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and our hearts are released to reach out to him, to connect 
to him. And that is why in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 53, um, all the way, uh, Jesus reflects about him being the bread of life. And therefore he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And so at the Lord's table, we are connecting and communing with the Lord who is the giver of life. And so we are tapping life from him who gives life as we take those elements. And therefore, beloved, as we come to the Lord's table, it is not a mere um, activity and a traditional religious routine, but it is inviting the Lord in our hearts and connecting with him. Number two, we look ahead. In verse 26, um, Paul uh, quotes Jesus again, saying, proclaim this until I come again. He says, we do this and continue doing this until the Lord comes again. Meaning that at the Lord's Supper, we keep our Christian hope alive until Jesus Christ comes again. As we come to the Lord's table, our hearts are reminded that yes, we are on this side of eternity, but there is a life that has been prepared for us, and that life is given by Jesus Christ, whose death and resurrection and promise we remember at the Lord's table. And therefore, it is a sure hope of eternal life. It is an anticipation of a better life to come. And that anticipation, beloved, prompts us, therefore, to live sinless lives. Because when at the Lord's table, we are remembering the Lord that he will come and take us to be with him, to live with him. And he says elsewhere in scripture that only the righteous will see God. And therefore, it means that as we come to the Lord's table every single day, our endeavor should be to live sinless lives so that that eternal life that is promised will be ours as well. But number three is that we look within. In verse 27 to 28, but also in verse 31 to 32, Paul is talking about examine yourself. Examine yourselves. It is important to remember that at this point, Paul is not merely talking about being super holy for you to come to the Lord's table. No, that is not the teaching that Paul is making here. Rather, Paul is warning that we should not come to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. What does this unworthy manner mean? Unworthy manner means that we must first examine our hearts and confess any sin in sincerity to the Lord so that the Lord may accept us back into fellowship with him. In the liturgy, we say, in the communion liturgy, we say, all of you who repent of your sins, who love your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the way of Jesus, come with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen you. That invitation is an invitation to take time and examine the state of your heart, examine the state of your life. Because we do not come to the Lord's table casually, as I said earlier, as a religious routine, as many of us have been doing today. I'm afraid to say that in our context today and in our church today, the, the reverence for the Lord through the Lord's table has waned a bit. And we tend to do this as a religious routine. Even the way we come for it, which I will talk about in a short while, portrays our attitude that does not take what Christ did for us at the cross very seriously. Remember, Paul is saying, every time you take this, you are remembering the Lord's death. Meaning, as you come, your mind is focused on the Lord. And that mind that is focused on the Lord is also doing an examination of your life and asking, am I worthy? Am I in a right state with the Lord? And so it is a solemn remembrance and it's a solemn thanksgiving. Meaning, if there is any sin that resides in you at the time that you are coming for communion at the table, then you are encouraged 
to restrain yourself. If you have quarreled with your spouse or handled money dishonestly, or if there is a stain of sin in you, then it is spiritually demanded that you remain seated on your seat and restrain yourself from taking Holy Communion until you settle these matters and repent before the Lord by confessing your sins. Paul is very clear in what he's teaching in this passage. In verse 29 to verse 30, he actually talks of the consequences of coming to the Lord's table with a baggage of sin over us. He says, verse 29 to 30, for anyone who eats or drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and are sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. He's simply saying this is a serious spiritual transaction. If you come up to the table carelessly, then it causes even some of you to die. Falling asleep there simply means some of you have died because of the casual manner uh, in which you come to the Lord's table. But then, as I transition out of that, point number two, how should we partake of communion? Four quick things. Number one, when we come to the Lord's table, we should come in an orderly manner. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, says that it should be done decently and in order. And you know, Anglicans, we are known to be a church of order. And that is why we have the sidesmen and the ushers who, when you come to the Lord's table up there, they guide you. We don't just uh, get out like a chicken that are uh, released from my mother's house and everyone runs to whichever direction they want to run from. Um, we come in an orderly manner. You sit and wait until you're signaled and directed and you're guided up at the rail to go and, and then you take in an orderly manner. Why? Because still in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, our God is a God of order. He's not a God of disorder, but a God of order and of peace. So it must be done in an orderly way. Number two, how do we protect? Only those who qualify should receive. And this means quite a number of things. One, you must be confirmed, meaning you must be a communicant who is confirmed by a bishop. Unfortunately, uh, because uh, of the fluidity of faith, especially in the city, many of us come from various congregations where we never had a background where we are confirmed. When we come, there they teach that as long as you're saved, you are allowed. And that's a theological debate for another time. And so we end up getting into this whole mix without knowing the theological significance and the traditional teaching of our church. You must be confirmed by a bishop for you to be a communicant at the Lord's table. But you must also have repented, as I quoted that uh, portion of the liturgy, you must have repented genuinely of your sins and uh, must have said that prayer of confession in the liturgy with a lot of seriousness. Sometimes we take the liturgy to be just mere words. Those words are meant to prepare our hearts and to help us to confess and get rid of any form of sin that would weigh our hearts down. If you are a communicant, if you are a communicant, but for example, you got married to a second wife or you left your marriage and got involved with another person, then you are disqualified. You are to restrain yourself until such a time as the priest and the bishop will guide you through a process of restoration and readmission as spelled out in the Anglican Church of Kenya Constitution 2002. If you are married outside of the church, again, you are not supposed to take communion because being a communicant requires that your marriage is solemnized in church following the Christian tradition. And therefore, if you have been coming up to the front and you're not married in church, I silently and very pastorally say, consider restraining yourself. But I have an option for you, that in August, we have mass wedding. Please, could you consider signing up for mass wedding 
so that uh, we can get this thing out of the way and that you can be coming to the Lord's table. Um, but also, anyone who lives in sin secretly or who is known to be a sinner publicly, I know sometimes you know those who live in sin, whether it's known or you know it yourself alone, friends, you are advised not to come to the Lord's table until you repent. And that is why in our liturgy we give you that space to repent. Don't rush and do it in a juakali manner, in a casual way, so that you can approach the Lord's table, but you can take time and genuinely talk to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness. If these are weighty issues that you cannot deal with within the context of a service, remain seated, and I'll give guidance a little later as I finish, remain seated and go sort out this and then you can come again. But Father, how do you take? You come forward, and that is why we guide you on coming forward. You come forward to the altar rail, you kneel or stand. If your tradition in your church is to stand, here we invite you to kneel. Once you kneel, you are meant to say a silent prayer in your heart or make a sign of the cross and wait for the bread to be served. How do we wait for the bread to be served? Um, if you want to receive, you put your hands in this manner with your strongest hand on top um, and you put it a little elevated so that the minister can have an easy access to your hands and once they put it there, again, whisper silently prayer. Say, thank you, Lord, for your body which was given for me and then direct it and eat it Pole pole, that is slowly. <laughs> you know, Anglicans are known for order. If you went to the village, they do it in a very nice way, a very religious way. Actually, you think they're in heaven already. Once you eat the bread, if you don't want bread, you are also allowed to come. You might have an issue you're dealing with, but you're allowed to come, but you do your hands like this, cross your arms, and then the priest will recognize that this one only needs the blessing. They will simply pray for you and bless you. We encourage you also to come with your children. Uh, they can come and then the priest lays their hands and bless them. Once you take the bread, wait for the wine, the small cups or the chalice. As the chalice comes, again, say a short prayer, do a sign of the cross and take it. And once you take, wait for the person next to be served before you leave, again, order, so that you don't begin uh, uh, fighting or pushing things there. Uh, wait for the next person. As the priest moves to the th uh, second person from you, then nicely get out and walk back to your seat. And, and I will say a little more on that. As you do this, all through this process, your thoughts should be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, you should be meditating on the cross. And as you come back to your seat, Think of the cross. Think of Jesus. Think of what he did for you. And as you sit there, just say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to commune with you today. Thank you for uh, being my friend and connecting with my heart. Please, as you come back to say, do not look at your WhatsApp, which messages have come through. When I walk through, when I walk through and other clergy walk through the congregation to serve those who are unable in the congregation, you know, today we have very big uh, screens. Huh? You see people literally on WhatsApp. Others would walk out. We encourage you to sit, meditate. If the choir is singing, connect with that song and just worship. It's part of a worship experience. However late we are, it's part of a worship experience. Amen? But thirdly, if you come after the creed, you are required not to take communion. Once you come after the creed, please remain and wait. If there's another service with communion, you will take. Why? Because you must state your faith at that point and make confession of your sins. You cannot just come casually. One of the problems we have in this church is issues of parking, but also general lateness. People will come one hour into the service, and they just walk right to the table without going through those process. The teaching from the Lord is that restrain yourself and allow yourself to take another time. But number four, how often should we take? Scripture says whenever. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says whenever you take it. Other versions say as often as you take it, meaning we can take communion every single day. You can do it every day uh, as often as you drink it because it renews 
your focus on Jesus Christ. Communion renews your focus on Christ and it brings you closer to the Lord. And that is why we serve communion every day, Monday to Friday, 7 o'clock in this church, because we want to make you closer to the Lord, to remember what Christ did for you. And we invite you to be coming for this service. Finally, as I finish, what are some of the misgivings? One, please, number one, correcting these misgivings. Number one, Holy Communion does not take away our sins. It does not remove our sins. Some of us have been living in sin, but we come to the Lord's table with the assumption that if we take more or drink more, then it will take away our sins. And actually, I know people who deliberately will avoid the small cups and go for the big cup and gulp a lot, thinking that that will wash away their sins. Beloved, no. No. It does not wash our sins. Let me tell you what happens. Confession of your sin draws you closer to God. And this is controversial if, if you think differently. Communion does not draw you closer to God, but confession of your sin draws you closer to God. Then communion retains you, keeps you right in fellowship with God. It, confession of your sins brings you to the Lord, and then communion keeps you right at the center of, of, of your fellowship with God because you're remembering him every now and again. As you remember him every now and again, you cannot sin. You don't live a life of sin. And that is why we are connected with him. Jesus says in John 6, 6 verse 50, that if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. We are connecting with life at the communion table. Number two, there are those who prefer to take communion from a particular priest. War unto us priests. If the archbishop is here or the archbishop of Canterbury is around, the cues will be directed towards the archbishop and most of us will be there just, just, just waiting. If, if it's a, and, you know, Anglicans cue strategically. And I know life requires strategy. So they will not go. As much as the ushers will be inviting them, please go. There's space. There's space here, Neil. No. They are timing. How is Archbishop going round? <laughs> and they, they, they aim for that. Beloved, um, it is not about an archbishop. It is not about assistant provost or the provost or a deacon. It is about God. And let me just remind us of this. That at the communion table, the grace dispensed there to each communicant is not dependent on the spiritual state of a minister. Rather, it is dependent on the Lord himself who avails grace for you to connect with that grace at that moment. But secondly, it is also dependent on your faith and how you've worked out your faith with the Lord. So those two things are critical. By the way, controversially again I say, you could be served by a minister who has questionable blah, blah, blah. But that serving of the sacrament remains valid because it's not about that minister. It is about the Lord and the state of your heart. And so we invite you, please, when you are guided by the ushers, kneel randomly and the Lord will minister his grace to you. <laughs> Number three, um, there are some times when relationships go sour and the priests and the lay readers can become like policemen or uh, moral detectives who look at people to serve or not to serve. And I've served in contexts where somebody would be skipped because they're deemed to be a little uh, sinful. Um, friends, it is not on anyone to deny anyone communion. Please come. Come as you wish. And that point that I mentioned about being a sinner, it is up to you. If you come and you, feel, you, you, you think that you come, and you still have sin, it will be up to you, but not up to the priest. You are allowed to come. But I know uh, sometimes also we feel that it will be an embarrassment for me to remain seated when everyone else is going, yet Evans had said that if you are in sin, you should remain seated. Consequently, I am a sinner, that's why I am seated, and people will begin talking about me. Friends, let me correct that and say this. It is more honorable and a demonstration of Christian maturity for you to remain seated and correct your issues with the Lord, and the Lord 
will, uh, will, 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 will correct you and will bring you into a relationship with him. Amen? Amen? And so in conclusion, I pray that from now on we will take time to examine our hearts and come to the Lord's table in a worthy manner so that we do not take communion in an unworthy manner. That our coming forward will be characterized by reverence for the Lord, but also by confidence that we have a solid, qualified relationship with the Lord. For those who are not confirmed, there is an opportunity for you. In January 2020, we are opening up recruitment for confirmation classes. Kindly sign up for confirmation so that the Archbishop will confirm you so that you can become a communicant and enjoy this fellowship that we do enjoy here as believers in our Christian faith. And I share this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.